Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we are going to be in conversation about the Taliban in Afghanistan, its history, and the Taliban of today. We'll also be obviously talking about the current situation in Afghanistan. My guest for this conversation is Nazif Sharani. Nazif Sharani is a professor of anthropology, Central Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Indiana University. He is the author of the book Revolutions and Rebellions in Afghanistan and Modern Afghanistan, The Impact of 40 Years of War. Nazif Sharani is also from Afghanistan, and over the years he has conducted a great deal of field research uh, in Afghanistan. He joins me via Zoom. Nazif Sharani, it is my great pleasure pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. Good morning, uh, Mr. Jesserich. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you again on uh, the KPFA program. Good to have you, as, as, as always. Um, let's be, I just want to begin with, with your thoughts about this current moment that, that we're going through. We, we haven't talked to you uh, since things started happening uh, at the end of last week. Well, what has happened, of course, is... Um, should have been really expected. Uh, but uh, the country, United States government, as well as those in Afghanistan, have been taken by surprise. And part of that has to do with the fact that, um, as President Biden um, indicated, the expectation was the U.S. had uh, invested in a huge uh, security force of 350,000 with um, lots of uh, weaponry and, of course, money to keep them going and so on, and that they should have been or they were expected to defend the country and that uh, they did not do so. We're, we're talking uh, about the Afghan military. The Afghan military, of course. The United States uh, withdrew. It uh, was in the process of withdrawing the last of the 2,500 soldiers who were left there. And that essentially um, created the vacuum, essentially, uh, in the country for Taliban to not really conquer any place. Rather, uh, places were sort of left to them um, because the security forces were not willing to support or willing to fight for a corrupt government that we had kept in power uh, with our presence for the last 20 years. And everybody had been fed up with, with the corruption, with abuse, with um, horrors that they had created. And they created this, this crisis at the end. Um, uh, either there, there were sort of possibilities of machinations that the corrupt government also had um, this idea of they are not going to survive, but they're going to hand over the country, particularly in northern Afghanistan, western Afghanistan, central Afghanistan, uh, basically handed them over to Taliban, who are also their co-tribesmen, who have similar sorts of ideas, or at least they did until recently, although there's some, some indications of maybe some minor change, but that needs to be uh, proven. We don't know. But at any rate, the government um, forces, even where people um, had uh, essentially risen against Taliban and ready to organize themselves to fight against Taliban, they needed support, weapons uh, from the government to fight, but the central government did not provide them. And not only that, where there were military posts and garrisons and so forth, they were allegedly called um, either by um, the government in Kabul or by the United States Special Representative Zal Khalilzad, who was in Qatar, the, the guy who negotiated under Trump administration this um, peace agreement with the Taliban, that he was the one who was also allegedly calling and telling the um, military forces not to fight, just surrender. And so as a result, Taliban basically took the entire country within two, two three weeks um, without a fight, without much of a fight. The only places where they fought were in northern Afghanistan, particularly the areas where the Uzbek uh, population lived, and their uh, leader, Marshal Dustum, was uh, ready to fight. But again, he was also not given the uh, support that, that he expected from the center. And uh, so that a lot of uh, Uzbeks, in fact, in Uzbek towns have suffered the most in this war in the last two, three weeks in the country, whereas the, the other places have been essentially spared of the worst part of the fight. 
Sounds like is, sounds like what you're saying here is that there are groups in Afghanistan in different parts of the country that were ready and willing to fight the Taliban, but they were never armed. And as we talk about these groups, it almost sounds like a, a throwback. And you'll correct me, but it sounds like a throwback to um, after the Soviet Union left, when you had different groups within the country. Uh, that's right. So the similarities are uh, stunning, in fact. Uh, there were lots of people who were willing to fight. In the western part of the country, Amir Ismail Khan, somebody who was the local commander from the 1980s and then had joined the government and had been in various um, cabinet portfolios. Um, he's 75 years of age, but he took up um, uh, arms and invited these people, and people were with him, and they fought for about um, two weeks, and and eventually um, he was uh, deceptively invited to a discussion in the uh, local um, military garrison, and uh, he went there in the expectation that they, they were going to be discussing the strategy for defending the city of Herat against Taliban, and he was essentially captured and handed over to Taliban in the garrison also uh, went to uh, Taliban. So in the in western part of the country, that's what happened. In the north, where uh, Marshal Dustum and also uh, Ata Noor, who was also from the jihadi uh, commanders of the earlier time and a very powerful for a while uh, governor of uh, Balkh in mazar sharif they were ready to fight. And uh, they even had a meeting um, with President Ghani in mazar sharif who, who promised, uh, you know, he was going to provide them with all the weapons and things, and then he uh, did not keep his promise. So that they were, again, driven into, across the bridge that the Russians actually left um, back in uh, 1988. Um, uh, he had to retreat to, to Uzbekistan, and, and uh, the, both of them did. And they're there. So the northern provinces essentially fell, and eventually Kabul also fell. Um, just three days ago. What did it mean for Ashraf Ghani to leave the country? Well, uh, he is a coward. He was he was corrupt. And I think uh, we have been hearing now from um, President Trump, former President Trump, saying that he was um, um, uh, uh, somebody who could not be trusted. And um, even uh, Joe Biden has said that um, he was not, uh, he was corrupt and he was not uh, good. And so that uh, the, the consensus is that uh, uh, he is responsible for this crisis and for leaving the country the way he did without notice to even his own close advisors. All of them were surprised and he just packed up and allegedly with a lot of cash and a lot of loot uh, in a plane to uh, Tajikistan initially, and then now they're saying he's somewhere in the UAE, in the Gulf. Um, uh, so uh, he is responsible. And I think um, uh, there has been no accountability on the part of uh, leaders who do harm to their own nations. And then at the end, they run away and they go and they're given protection someplace and they live their lives you know, with the spoils that they, they stole from the country. I think in this case, there should be accounting. I, I believe the Interpol should intervene, should arrest them and return them to Afghanistan so that uh, he gives um, an account of um, uh, the, the uh, crimes that he has committed against the people of Afghanistan and against uh, the poor and the needy who were uh, suffering under their administration. It's not just him. There are a whole bunch of them uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, they were kleptocrats, and everybody knows the in the country. But unfortunately, it seems that they are being again uh, uh, brought into the uh, political picture, and the uh, Taliban seem to be negotiating with them. Uh, for an inclusive government. Any government that is inclusive of these people cannot be inclusive because uh, they are really um, the scum of the society. They have caused uh, society harm and they've brought the country into, into this crisis. They should be left out of the future of Afghanistan politics. People who have been left out completely are the youth of Afghanistan about 65 to 70 percent of Afghanistan's today's population is less than 25 years of age, that they have essentially grown up during the Taliban. 
And amongst them, there are some some of the really well-educated, skilled, and talented people uh, who are also scared. These are the ones, many of them, who are scared at the airports and, you know, running out uh, from the country. The fact that people are so scared and, and so uh, adamant about leaving the country itself is giving a very powerful message about what Taliban are all about. Uh, so that people have not. Taliban claimed that people submitted to them. People uh, accepted them. That is not the truth. The truth is that people are scared. They, they um, uh, are um, fearful of um, what will happen to them. And, and that in itself is, I think, something that Taliban should understand. And if they want to reassure the people, they have to prove it. That not just simply, although they have been speaking very softly, that they're going to um, not take revenge uh, against their enemies and that they're going to um, essentially declare amnesty to everybody and, and uh, they're going to allow women to work, but adding that in accordance with Sharia, which they have not defined and we don't know what exactly that means. If it means the kinds of things that um, they practiced earlier on or is taught in the madrasas and the seminaries in Pakistan that they come out of, uh, those are not Islamic at all. For example, um, uh, it is uh, not expected or permitted or, or even encouraged that piety should be uh, monitored by uh, government. It's not government's job to uh, essentially enforce piety of people or even um, to engage in uh, moral policing. These are not the things that Quran um, has um, uh, has any any indication for. In fact, the job of the Prophet of uh, 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 Prophet Muhammad in the Quran was that he should essentially inform the revelations and teach the people, but not force them. There is no forcing in religion. It's, it's very clear in, in the Quran that um, um, uh, and unfortunately, what they're beginning to do is now uh, demanding that people should go uh, to mosques at prayer times and close their shops and um, go in, and pray um, under their duress, under, under their force. And that's not a, not, that is not uh, what Quran is saying. It is, it is voluntary. People have to uh, accept, believe, know, and want to do voluntarily themselves if they don't then then it's not it's not really faith it's not really uh, islam as such and also um demanding that people should grow beards a certain length and women have to uh, be covered completely and you know a lot of these things are local traditional practices which they have basically made it into an islamic uh, prescription which they are not so I think if they need to go back to the Quran, they need to back to go back to the Prophet's own practices and traditions, which we have these uh, these texts preserved. So instead of this uh, label Sharia, which is really made up of uh, human beings, um, um, you know, uh, political essentially assertions and political um, uh, rules that they have created for control of people rather than uh, allowing people to practice what what the Quran um, teaches them which is uh, to, to uh, abide by the by the values Quranic values which are extremely humane and human and uh, and very positive and nobody nobody has any objections to obeying the Quranic norms and rules but uh, people do object to others who make up things and then says that it, it is in the Quran while it is not in the Quran. So that's that's the challenge I think that uh, uh, Taliban are facing. Whether they're going to be able to uh, leave Sharia in, in terms of a historically produced um, uh, body of legal practices and in turn to the Quran, turn to the original sources and interpret them in accordance with the 20th century needs of human beings in Afghanistan and, and uh, outside of Afghanistan or not is is the question that needs to be uh, addressed. Do you, or how, how do you take what the Taliban has been saying so far? Uh, saying, as you mentioned, 
uh, a universal amnesty for people who had worked with the previous regime, that their desire to create a, an inclusive government. Mm-hmm. What it, do, do you think they're sincere on that? You, we, there is a huge trust gap between what they say and what they have done. You see, there is a, there is a, a, a phenomenal information gap between um, the people of Afghanistan and who the Taliban are. Taliban are essentially known for the first five, six years of their, uh, their rule is uh, brutal and uh, have, have continued to be essentially a war machine. They're not a governance machine. They don't know how to govern. They have been fighting. For 20 they're, years. They're in, their, they're in their, 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 their rule for five, six years they fought. And then um, since about 2004, 2005, they have engaged in, in fighting against the United States presence and NATO and, and all the rest. So they, the only thing people know about them is that they are engaging in suicide bombing and, and uh, collective harm against uh, hospitals, schools, um, uh, mosques. You name it, everything. That's that's their their basically um, uh, uh, sort of uh, perspective or their their vision, a people's vision of them, I should say. So now they are saying, uh, and I should also add, uh, people don't know who Taliban leaders are. In in political environment, uh, people need to know who uh, claims to be taking leadership positions or doing, you know, making decisions for them and so forth that they should know. We do not know. Their first um, Amir or Amir al-Mu'minin, Mullah Omar, um, was never seen. Not never seen in, in the media. He, he appeared once publicly, I think, in a ceremony in Kandahar. And he died. And then his death was um, uh, kept secret for three years. And now we don't know who the, his uh, most recent successor, Mullah Hebatullah, is. And there is some even uh, alleged, uh, alleged reports that he may not be alive either and that they may have kept it a secret. Nobody has seen him. There's a picture being printed uh, now and then in, in certain places uh, making reference that this is Hebatullah. Nobody has heard him speak publicly. So their only face, there are two faces, really, is one is Mullah Baradar, this guy who uh, negotiated the agreement with Zal Khalilzad. And again, he has spoken very little, very little to know, and he is not very articulate either. Um, and they have two spokesmen. The two spokesmen, one of them is Mullah Mujahid, whom you saw giving that conf- uh, uh, press conference the other day. He seems to be very articulate. Um, and there is another one called uh, Dr. Naim Wardak, who was their spokesman in, in Doha. And these two have been basically talking about um, Taliban issues and coming in social media occasionally. And now that they are in power, they have been giving press conferences and so forth. So other than these, we really don't know who is. We know that there is some kind of a um, um, committee of their, their uh, commission or, or something of their leadership in Quetta in Pakistan. And there is one in Peshawar uh, also, supposedly. But the challenge now is, how can you, how can you, with all that baggage, all that background of Taliban being a war machine who has done harm to the country, who has destroyed, has built nothing, and has been engaged in the destruction of even the small amount of infrastructure that was in place, and uh, how could they overcome um, that image and uh, convince the people that they are there uh, actually wanting to create an Islamic government that is inclusive, that's just, that's fair. And and I hope that they would do that. I, I, I really hope and pray that they could do that. Whether they are going to be able to do that is uh, questionable at this point. They have a lot to do to prove themselves that they have changed. And, and people don't believe, so far anyway, that they have in fact changed. 
This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Nazif Sharani. Nazif Sharani is a professor of anthropology, Central Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Indiana, Indiana University. He's the author of the book, Revolutions and Rebellions in Afghanistan and Modern Afghanistan, The Impact of 40 Years of War. He is from Afghanistan himself, and he has done years of uh, field research uh, in the country. Nazif Sharani, let's take a step back in time. Where did the Taliban come from? Well, it goes back to 1978 when um, a coup d'etat in Kabul occurred and a communist party of Afghanistan was behind that coup d'etat and the former Soviet Union was behind that. And who was in power at this time? I'm sorry? Who was in power at this time? At that time, uh, somebody named Sardar Dawood, who was... A royal family member who had also staged his own coup against his own cousin and brother-in-law, um, uh, the king of Afghanistan, in 1973. So the monarchy essentially was abolished by one of its own members, uh, Sardar Dawood, who had been prime minister during the um, uh, uh, monarchy in the 1940s and uh, until about ni- early 1950s. And then he was sort of left out of power for about 10 years. There was something referred to as sort of experimenting with constitutional monarchy. From 1963, 64 until 1973 for about 10 10 years. And then um, Dawood came out of basically hiding in in league with the Communist Party members and staged his coup against uh, the king uh, and became and declared the country as a republic. So he was ruling for five years is the Islamic Republic, the head of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. And then uh, the very same communists who had collaborated with him to overthrow the monarchy also uh, staged a military coup against him in 1978. So the, and with the Soviets being behind them, that's the beginning of the end for Afghanistan, essentially. And the country has been in war ever since. But there was a... Uh, I, I want to keep going. I want to ask one question, though, before this period of time. I, I've i heard, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or, or what, but I've heard Afghanistan was a very different country between before this period of time. Well, there was no the difference in the sense that there was no war, but the country was basically a big prison. You know, you, you can have uh, peace in, in prisons. This is not uncommon. Very peaceful places or prisons where people don't have any rights and they're controlled and so forth. So Afghanistan um, didn't for about 50 years. Uh, I, if I may just go back very briefly in terms of the creation of Afghanistan. Afghanistan was created during the so-called the Great Game in Central Asia between Tsarist Russia and British India. These two empires in the 19th century were essentially competing for territory. And that territory was towards Central Asia. Russians by 1860s took much of Central Asia as we know. The um, uh, Khanates of Khiva, the Khanate of Bukhara, and the Khanate of Pukhan. These were three uh, local sort of uh, small kingdoms of uh, primarily Turkic-speaking people, Uzbeks in general and Turkmen's and others. So Russians took those by 1860s. And the the British Indians were very worried that they may come down, swoop down essentially and, you know, come to India and dislodge them from India and have uh, access to Indian Ocean and all the rest. And, of course, they didn't want that. So what they wanted to uh, do was they created this big wall that really goes back to this notion of security of uh, separating with walls uh, of like the Great Wall of China in ancient terms. So they essentially created a wall, a buffer state, and that buffer state uh, separating uh, Tsarist Russia from British India came to be known as Afghanistan. There was no Afghanistan before that. The term didn't exist. Um, so that what does the, the term mean? What does Afghan mean? mean? Afghan, Afghan is equivalent and synonymous with Pashtun or Patan. And that's significant um, here. Yes. 
So it's it's the name of a one ethnic group in Afghanistan that the British refer to them as Patan. They themselves refer to themselves as Pakhtun or Pashtun. And uh, also they are known as Afghan by the local, in the vo- local vernacular by other people. So Afghanistan essentially meant the land of the Pashtun, the land of the Afghans, the land of the Patans, if you like. So that's what it came to be known. And since the, the country came to be named after one of the ethnic groups, but the British also made sure that there were other ethnic groups includes, included in this, um, and so that they, they kept some Tajiks from um, the Central Asian Tajikistan, which was later created by Stalin, also Uzbeks, in Uzbekistan, that was created by Stalin to the north. In Turkmenistan, which was also created by Stalin in 1924. So some Turkmens were also kept here uh, in, within the borders of this new buffer state. And then there were people, uh, Parsi one, along the Iranian border, they were kept. The Baluch, who were divided into Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, they were also kept uh, part of them in Afghanistan. And then they essentially drew that eastern border, which cut the Pashtuns into half. They kept the, the most fertile land that Pashtuns occupied within British India, which then later became Pakistan, in the most marginal mountainous land that had very little or nothing economically was given to Afghanistan. So that Durand line, 1,200 miles of it, that separated British India later became the borders between Pakistan and modern day Afghanistan. So this is this is the story of this this country's creation in 1880. During after the Second Anglo-Afghan War, they invaded Afghanistan twice in 18th century, uh, 19th century, once in, in the later part of 1830s until 1842, and uh, there is a major defeat of the British army and wiping out of 20,000 soldiers and. Um, camp followers and so forth. Uh, there's a lot written about that. And then in 1889, 18, uh, they came back to Afghanistan because of what Russians were doing in the north. And then by uh, in 1880, they found uh, one princeling from the royal um, um, lot at that time who were fighting for succession with one another. The whole of 19th century in Afghanistan, in fact, was wars of succession between these uh, royals who were finding support from different countries and different regions and different uh, people. It's One interesting other, because Russia's had a long then historic interest yes, yes. in Afghanistan. And, which, and, this you know, particular, and this particular guy named Abdurrahman was actually uh, spent the whole decade of 1870 in Samarkand under the Tsarist rule. And he became very fond of Peter the Great in his policies of abuse and harm and horror against his own people. His hero became Peter the Great, and that's what he practiced. So the British in 1880 essentially crowned him as the uh, Amir of Afghanistan and gave him a lot of uh, weapons, modern weapons at that time, and plenty of cash, and told them essentially to, um, you're not going to uh, have uh, autonomy on your foreign policy, but you can do whatever you want with this piece of uh, real estate that we've created for you. And of course, he went to uh, work and used the weapon to uh, decimate, essentially, local community leaders and uh, created, uh, and he came to be known as the Iron Amir because by the British, British labeled him as Iron Amir. So it is 20, 19 years or 20 years of um, rule, essentially, he... Um, uh, subordinated all the people within his domain and created, again, a, um, a government that was highly centralized and highly um, based on fear. Fa- favor and fear were the two, two tactics that he used, essentially. Uh, people who um, were willing to submit to him voluntarily rewarded them, and those who didn't um, decimated them, killed them, exiled them, yeah. and, and all the rest. The, the, so that's the beginning of the uh, sort of Afghanistan story of dependence, that this ruler was utterly dependent on foreign money, foreign weapons, and continued. His son was also dependent on that, and then his grandson in 1990 declared independence. Re- really With, interesting. I mean, th- this is very interesting. Just for, for time's sake, so we can fit this in. I'm, I'm going to move us up to, because when, when I'm listening to you, I'm, then I think about the Soviet invasion of, of 1979. 
Mm-hmm. By the time the Soviet invasion happens, Russia had already been involved in Afghanistan for more than a hundred years, as as did as did Great Britain. Absolutely. And then you have yeah. the U.S. helping the opposition to the uh, uh, to the Soviet uh, yes. rule or, or the communist rule in Afghanistan. I, I mean, this it makes when we say the Great Game. We think of what right It is continued. It has continued in, but yeah, it's still happening. Form. Yeah, it's just the form has slightly changed. You see, what happened in nineteen? This is important. In nineteen nineteen, when the grandson of uh, Abdurrahman declared the independence, the British cut off the subsidies, no more weapons and no more money, and this guy, uh, allegedly reformist king and so on and so forth, had to tax people, and he taxed not his own uh, tribesmen, but others. So the Tajiks in the north of Kabul and the Hazara, uh, Hazaras in, in further um, uh, in, in western Afghanistan and so forth. So the taxation became a, a means for corruption, his officials. So uh, they always, uh, the, the um, explanation of why he was driven out of uh, his um, uh, royal status is that he was reformist king and people stood against him because of his reform. That is only a part of it. The other part was oppression, corruption, and abuse that came because he didn't have the money that his father and uh, grandfather had, so that he had to uh, extract. And in that extraction, he heavily taxed his own people, and that's what uh, essentially resulted in his rebellion, and, and he was driven out. Uh, in, in 1929. And the person who did that was coming just from north of Kabul, a Tajik, who, who had been, the communities had been taxed the highest in the most. So that rebellion was really an economic uh, issue, an oppression issue. And uh, nobody recognized him, nobody gave him a penny. He lasted nine months. And then what happened? The British brought the next royal family with British weapons and British money and imposed on Afghanistan the uh, dynasty that lasted until 1978. And that was uh, Nader Khan. Nader Khan and his brothers essentially were brought in by the British um, to Afghanistan in 1929, installed. So you have another another uh, you know um, period of uh, dependency on British money. And then came the Cold War. So the Cold War is when the Soviet Union enters with America in competition and giving support to Afghan royal regime. And then the coming of the communist regime uh, and, and then the rise of this um, uh, resistance movement uh, based on Islam. And of course, that's when America then comes into Afghanistan in 1979 during Jimmy Carter's um, uh, uh, rule. Uh, and they start CIA's funneling of money and weapons, not because of any love of Afghans and Afghanistan, but because of uh, the proxy war they wanted to fight with Soviet Union, particularly since America had been just defeated by, with the help of Soviets in Vietnam, uh, so that they wanted to take revenge. And that's what happened, that in the 10 years, in the 1980s, uh, 1980s United States funneled uh, with uh, a lot of money, they, some alleged maybe ten billion dollars, but it was apparently also matched by the Soviet, by the Saudis, who chipped in dollar for dollar. So we're talking about the twenty billion dollars in the nineteen twenties, and this is when also America and CIA engaged in recruiting uh, a lot of jihadi fighters in Afghanistan from the United States as well as Europe and everywhere else, and that's when we supported the Bin Laden. To, to go and fight the, the Russians. So that interna- internationalization of jihad was really uh, one of the projects of CIA in the United States in the 1980s in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. And, it, it, and then, of course, when, by the time that Soviets were defeated, they withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh, we also withdrew. We, we declared that we have won the Cold War and we came home. And, of course, we left Afghanistan to the uh, neighbors, essentially. Uh, And they could not agree because of, again, this um, uh, evolved tribal politics and ethnic politics that had been put together in the 1980s uh, by the international community. They were all dependent. All all the commanders were dependent on some 
outside force and that they had essentially support from outside and they could compete and they were encouraged to fight each other. And that's what um, prevented the creation of a functioning government by the uh, Islamic government, which they had been fighting for in the 1980s um, against the communists and against the Soviets. That didn't happen. And that, of course, resulted in the emergence of Taliban in Kandahar. And, and during the 19, from 1992 to about 95, the country had actually crystallized in terms of its regional political structure. The West, the Tajiks were, um, five provinces were under Ismail Khan. In the Northwest, five provinces that belonged primarily to the Uzbek population, they were under General Dustum then. And then uh, they had uh, the Eastern the Pashtuns, they had created a council. It's sort of uh, the areas along the Pakistani border. There were four or five provinces there that they had, they had even come almost to the point of uh, printing their own currency just before the um, uh, rise of Taliban. Hmm. And the rest of the country was uh, essentially in the hands of the government. The Ahmad Shah Massoud, the guy who was killed on, on September 9, 2001, uh, by Al-Qaeda. And so they controlled those. The only place that was a mess was Kabul. Everybody was fighting for it. And then Kandahar, where the Taliban emerged. There they could not agree to any sort of local governance. And that's what um, uh, made the Taliban to come and fill the, that gap. And then Pakistanis essentially turned them into a war machine, uh, which is the rest of it is really a uh, uh, you know, story that you all know, that uh, Taliban, uh, ISI, Pakistani, Central, uh, Pakistani intelligence service, essentially turned um, Taliban into uh, a formidable war machine that made them able to con conquer Western Afghanistan very quickly in 1995, and then Kabul in 1996, and then the war went on to the north, um, and uh, eventually um, the Al-Qaeda came back. Uh, in fact, um, bin Laden, and in between there was also the 1993 war in the Gulf against uh, Kuwait uh, that Saddam Hussein had, stay, you know, had indulged. So the Arab fighters who had been in the 1980s in Afghanistan had gone back home. And then they became uh, anti-American when America supported the 1993 war uh, in the Gulf, the first Gulf War. That, that's uh, when they turned? Yes, that's when they turned against the United States. And in fact, that's when Saudi Arabia uh, drove bin Laden to Yemen and then from Yemen to uh, East Africa uh, to... Um, uh, what is that? Uh, the, uh, the country just south of Sudan. Um, Sudan, sorry. Yeah, to Sudan and then from Sudan. In 2005, uh, he was brought back to Afghanistan by, uh, by Hikmatyar uh, in Pakistanis. But then they collaborated with uh, uh, Mullah Omar in Taliban. And eventually, they were the ones who perpetrated allegedly the. Um, uh, that's the, the attacks against New York and against Washington. Uh, and the rest is uh, essentially a story that we all know that uh, essentially brought about the last 20 years of our involvement in the longest war in Afghanistan. Was the Taliban the hardliners at the beginning that we would end up knowing them and what their reputation would be ever since? Well, the Taliban initially were really just a local uh, movement of maybe about 30 people with Mullah Omar against local atrocities by local commanders who were essentially misbehaving, killing and abusing and, and uh, calling chaos. So they rose against them and it was very positive development because they brought peace. They brought, uh, uh, you know, relative calm within their own province. If it had been just kept at that level, the country essentially would have crystallized into these regional, uh, almost federal kinds of uh, governance structure. Uh, each region being in control of itself with its own leaders and so on. All it needed was a central government that they could have coalesced and come and created a, you know, a weaker central government and then the war should have ended. But that's not what happened because the Pakistanis wanted to have total control of Afghanistan and they were looking for means to be able to do it. And their initial uh, instrument was uh, Hikmatyar, 
one of the uh, radical Islamist groups that they had supported during the 1980s, also a Pashtun um, uh, group. Uh, then they had uh, not been able to uh, make use of them instrumentally and effectively, so they switched their horses, essentially, and adopted Taliban instead of him. And uh, then uh, essentially led them to, to go and fight and conquer the rest of the country, which was a terrible mistake. And I think the, Tal- the Pakistanis have now come to realize that that was a mistake and that they are not favoring um, uh, Taliban exclusive rule now in, in Afghanistan because they know nobody can exclusively run Afghanistan uh, anymore. So that they have to accommodate, and that accommodation is contingent on how uh, Taliban will be able to form a government that is responsive to the demands of the people and the needs of the people, not the needs of a few kleptocrats from the last 20 uh, years of um, uh, uh, really corrupt regimes that we, Americans and international community, supported, but rather a, a regime that is truly responsive. And the only way, in my judgment, that can be done is if they decentralize. Afghanistan's regimes since 1880 has been extremely centralized and monopolized by few people who have relied on, uh, on foreign forces to give them money and give them weapons to impose themselves on the people of Afghanistan. They have never had legitimacy on the basis of popular uh, support. So what needs to be done now is to decentralize that political structure, allow for community self-governance so that people in different parts of the country can elect their own political um, officers at the village level, at the district level, at the provincial level, and at the national level. And that they also have a division of labor. Right now in Afghanistan, the government has, makes laws, implements the laws through central uh, branches of central government. We don't have local government in, in the country and also monitor those laws. So three things that one organ does, and you cannot do that because it's got full of conflict of interest. So what needs to be done is the central government has to have limited power, limited responsibility, making the national laws fine, but not the implementation. The implementation needs to be left to local governance that has to be created because we don't have those things created, but it can be created. And the third thing, or the second obligation the central government can keep is to um, help, uh, to, to maintain the rights of monitoring that the laws are implemented by local governments appropriately. Something that we do in the United States. Yeah. <clears throat> so what needs to be done is now we need to create these um, center, uh, local governments at the uh, village level, at the municipality level, at district level, at provincial level, so that people can elect their their, um, political leaders and they have to recruit their own civil servants. You know, one of the other horrors that has been going on through the centralized government is that centralized government appoints everybody, appoints all the um, civil servants, including the governors, commanders, judges, um, everybody. So imagine in the United States if the U.S. president could appoint all 50 governors and, you know, everyone else under them. I mean, what chaos could we have had under Trump? Just imagine that. But that's how Afghanistan has been run. Yeah. That, that these kleptocrats like, like Rani was uh, essentially appointing all of his, his uh, henchmen, people who, who were involved in his circle to, uh, of corruption. And so that's what the country is suffering from. And then at the end, because of this centralization, people could not defend themselves because they didn't have the means, because the central government did not um, give them the means to fight. So what we need is really decentralization of uh, a government that is based on no other than the principle of community self-governance, something that Afghans at the horizontal level, at the the base, are actually quite uh, familiar with, and very democratic in the communities of trust at the lower level. All we have to do is build on that. Instead of imposing something from the top by outsiders, build something from the bottom and create the vertical structure. The the base, the horizontal structure of uh, power is pretty solid in Afghanistan, and that's what has kept it going. All we have to do is build on that and build a a vertical structure of uh, uh, central government, uh, with minimal or minimum 
uh, rights and privileges and powers and uh, working with, uh, with the local governments that needs to be uh, created. And then uh, we can have all ethnic groups essentially be able to uh, participate in the decision making about their own political future. And the youth could be also empowered that way, not by, um, you know, selecting these uh, people who have other people have essentially chosen for this ethnic group, that ethnic group, and then include them in the cabinet which has been the practice in the last 20 years. That's not an inclusive politics. It the seems to me, politics, yeah. and we're almost out of time, but, yeah. but, but it seems to me, and I, and I don't mean to oversimplify this because history and, and nations are complex yes. entities, but it, it seems to me we can almost encapsulate the history of Afghanistan and the name Afghanistan itself as named after the Pashtuns, named after one people within a very diverse country yes. in which you end up finding these favoritisms and these mm -hmm. favoritisms then are manipulated mm -hmm. by outside forces. Exactly. I think if we have uh, put it together very simply and very elegantly in a multi-ethnic society such as Afghanistan, you cannot have this kind of strong centralized government based on ethnic politics or identity politics. It has to be um, brought down to the level where communities themselves have the right to make decisions about their own um, political future. And, and together they can then have a, a nation. You know, we are the most diverse society on earth, the United States of America. So Afghanistan is relatively speaking very homogeneous compared to what we are. But what is, what is the secret of the United States strength? The principles of community self-governance. That's where we, we care about our own municipal government, about our county government, and about our state government. Really, uh, Washington is, in some cases, very irrelevant to, to, to my life in Bloomington, to, Indiana. To, to our daily lives. No, you're absolutely yes. As somebody who covered yeah. Capitol Hill and a state legislature, what happened in yeah. a state legislature was far more consequential to people's daily lives. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the model that we're not advocating in societies like Afghanistan, what would have happened if we actually advocated for this and encouraged and created it 20 years ago? I can guarantee you, you would have had a much, much, much better Afghanistan and no Taliban. But that's not what we did. Instead, we um, supported the kleptocrats uh, who uh, essentially stole from us and stole from the people of Afghanistan and uh, brought the country into this miserable uh, crisis and also resulted in the defeat of the United States, particularly its image in the world. We have, we have our image has been torn completely, whether we like it or not. But I can tell you one thing, last thing that, that I could say. In 2002, when I first went to Afghanistan after many, many years, you know, the, the kind of love and care and, and admiration that existed in Afghan society for America was palpable. People had such great expectations that America is here and they're going to help us, you know, bring about better governance this time. What happened? People got uh, gradually disappointed, disillusioned, and now there is such hatred against the United States in, in large parts of Afghanistan that is unbelievable. So how did we, we manage to create that, that um, you know, uh, strong, positive feelings into this kind of negative feeling by what we did through these kleptocratic uh, lot and, and uh, supporting a regime that was not worth supporting? And at the end, that regime also abandoned the people of Afghanistan, as, as Ghani did. Nazi Sharani has been our guest. Nazi Sharani is professor of anthropology, Central Asian and Middle Eastern studies at Indiana University. He is the author of the book Revolutions and Rebellions in Afghanistan and Modern Afghanistan, The Impact of 40 Years of War. Nazi Sharani, thank you. You're most welcome.